I really want to begin by putting into context the work that any, any of us are able to do where children have been traumatized because I think there's a great tendency, particularly in my profession, to pay lip service to the social determinants of people's mental health, uh, but to go no further, to move straight from that to diagnosis and treatment. And I just want to kind of make a um, a plea for people to always keep social determinants front and center in their thinking. Um, and because the point where we operate is well down the hierarchy of influences on children's health and well-being. Um, so if we think for about the special case of refugee children, and, and my own experience is much more in the area of children who've been in immigration detention, which is the cruelest kind of refugee experience because you've escaped a place of danger and distress and been placed in an even worse environment. And so not just do we need to think about the direct effects of that on children and their families, but we also need to think about what our society is like and the ongoing influence of that society on any healing that's going to occur. And while we live in a society where people like John Howard and Scott Morrison haven't been brought to account and where we still um, have the mechanisms in place to treat people with deliberate cruelty and are still treating many people with deliberate cruelty, then we can't separate any of that happening from um, the day-to-day -day work we do and the compassion that we feel and the parts of our society that do work well still are living in the context of what is happening more broadly. Now, what we have to protect children in that environment, um, that culture that we live in, is a couple of wonderful protective institutions, um, basically schooling and preschool, um, childcare, that can um, supplement what parents can offer children, and particularly when parents are compromised in their own functioning through torture, trauma, and other experiences that they've had. Um, and really, if we think about what are the most important mental health influences on young people, it's not us in the helping professions, it's very much teachers and schools and childcare workers and early educators. And until and unless as a society, we value more highly our educators and our schools and pay teachers properly and particularly childcare workers who are grossly underpaid then we're not making the best of this protective layer that operates to ameliorate some of the harm that's been done to children and that they will continue to experience. And then there are the, the minority, but um, an increasingly large minority of children who present for the various services that are available, initially health and related services, when things get really bad, welfare, police, those kinds of services kick in. Um, and that's where most of the focus of what I say today is going to be. But I do want to keep coming back to the idea that we're operating in um, a social environment that um, is very much the shaping of and the constraint on the work that we do. Because mental disorders are, are, are social, not medical. Um, they're all about things that happen interpersonally. And, you know, the whole um, momentum of mental health research that focuses on what's happening inside people's brains um, feels to me to be grossly misguided because um, there are interesting things happening in people's brains that might eventually illuminate some of the work that we do, 
but to completely um, divert the vast majority of our investment in research into brain research, as is the official policy of uh, the main funding organizations, feels to be quite a misguided um, approach. Um, the diagnoses that we use in psychiatry are largely unexplanatory. Um, they um, describe patterns of presentation. They tell us nothing about why the person is presenting in that particular way. You, you might argue that um, that post-traumatic stress disorder is a counterexample to that because it, it's the one psychiatric diagnosis that does at least attempt to make some explanation of why the young or why the person is experiencing the pattern of distress that they're experiencing. I think it would be a better label if it were called post-traumatic stress rea post -traumatic reaction um, that made it explicit that the range of experiences that the person is having represent a response to the circumstances and not some kind of categorical shift from normal into some discrete disordered state um, for which we have very little or no evidence. And if you look at the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder or depression and anxiety and all of the other related psychiatric disorders, there's huge overlap between them. And I'm sure those of you who work clinically will have the experience of people who don't fit very well into any one category. And the dangerous, dreadful thing that psychiatrists tend to do about that is to give five or six different diagnoses, um, which is essentially, I think, quite lazy and strays away from the primary task that we have as clinicians, which is to try to make meaning out of um, young people's presentations. And for me, the best writing that I've come across about trauma and its effects on people is comes from over a hundred years ago from William Rivers, who was an anthropologist and psychiatrist, and talked about and worked with um, people who'd been psychologically damaged through their participation in the Great War. And um, they talked about um, Rivers and his colleagues talked about the necessity of helping the, the two problems that people face in relation to having had traumatic experiences. On the one hand, um, working very hard to keep it out of their mind at all times, which people can do, but it tends to form a kind of focus of um, unattended emotion and in order to keep that focus of unattended emotion shut down, we have to suppress other aspects of our emotional life. Um, on the other hand, some of the soldiers that they saw were completely preoccupied by their traumatic experience, couldn't talk or think about anything else. And neither of those strategies or responses um, was effective, both were associated with continued high levels of distress. And what Rivers and his colleagues did was to try to help the soldiers to at discrete times, give their full attention to the distress that they experienced, but to give themselves permission to put it out of their minds at other times. And I think that gives us a clues about what we need to do as clinicians, because I think we all know that we mustn't ever force children or adults to talk about trauma when they're not ready to talk about it, but it needs to be done in their time frame and on their terms. But also in the way we think about our traumatized, complex young people that we work with, that we some time, we need to give some time to focusing in our own minds in the way we think about their experience on the trauma but we also need to be prepared to put that out of our minds and not be overly focused on trauma. And learning the balance about that, I guess, is part of the skill and art of being a therapist. I, I 
I come back to this notion of making meaning of people's experience and that meaning needs to be in the social context it needs to be needs to take into account the social and ecological shaping factors on a young person so um, a child might have quite a traumatic experience and quite a traumatic series of experiences but be well able to metabolize those experiences if they've got well-functioning healthy parents who are able to manage their own anxiety that's brought up understandably by the child's distress um, because um, um, the meaning and the problem doesn't reside just within that individual even primarily within an individual but is something that is a product of the social and and particularly familial circumstances so for me one of the most powerful clinical tools i have is the genogram or family tree and i'm always always put aside at least five or ten minutes at close to the beginning of every assessment that i do to get a really good idea about who's who in the family and in refugee families it's also really important to know who's not there who's missing what would have been different if dad had been around um, and of course in refugee families you're going to turn up all kinds of grief and loss in the process of doing your genogram and it it feels to be a much less intrusive and distressing way of entering into those difficult areas than if you just ask a series of questions that the actual act of drawing a genogram and i try to make what i'm drawing visible to the family as i'm doing it um, is engaging and um, validating of the family and is meeting them initially in the interview on grounds where they're expert where they can give informed opinions whereas we start to ask them about what's wrong with them um, then they're less informed um, that sort of brings me on to another sort of practical point and i was going to leave the practical points mostly till a bit further on but i do want to make this practical point that um, we need to um, focus on what's happened to people rather than what's wrong with them um and to um go for the story rather than um uh, to be exploring things at the level of what the story is for this person and family rather than what the diagnosis is or what the symptoms are and um even in the face of quite um prolonged adverse experiences that have led to somebody becoming a refugee what they've experienced that is unmetabolized and continues to be distressing and disturbing for them is most often ordinary and understandable um, it's not usually the case that you need to um, you know make um, dramatic inferences about psychoanalytic inferences about what it is that shaped a person's experience sometimes that's the case um, but most often there's a story to be told that can be understood that can be empathized with that can be made sense of and that is probably I think the most important thing we do that validating experience the not being glib about it not labeling it not shutting it off not running away from it on the other side of it not chasing it not not being overexcited by it maintaining curiosity without being voyeuristic about what people's experience is and what we do when we occupy that position in our relation to our patients i think is we help to settle their minds um, to help them to move towards equanimity but we have to recognize that that's a, a stormy process and one where things might get better might get worse before they get better and i think whenever we're working with children we must always be working with parents as well and coaching and supporting them to tolerate their young people's distress and anxiety um, and um, of course to um, to change things that need to be changed 
um, to correct things that need to be corrected, to educate, to inform, to do all those kind of things. But often after we've done all of those things, we run out of things that are useful to do and we start to do things that aren't very useful. And one of the things that I think we often do, particularly in my profession, is we medicate. And when we medicate, a lot of the time what we're doing is lessening pain, but whose pain are we primarily wanting to lessen? A lot of the time, I think we're trying to want to lessen our own pain. It's very difficult for us to tolerate young people being distressed and anxious and overwhelmed. And we have to ask ourselves, am I, am, am I um, using an analgesic because this person is, in a level, is at a level of pain that they can't tolerate? Or is it somebody else who can't tolerate that level of pain? So these are, are, are kind of delicate clinical judgments that we need to make. Um, but, you know, I think I have a kind of mantra, which is um, it's much more important to be good at feelings than to feel good. Um, and a lot of our attitude towards young people as a society is that we want them to feel good and that we don't like them to feel bad. Now, I'm not proposing that we should suffer for the sake of suffering, that there's some kind of you know, benefit in the afterlife or something of, of spending time suffering during this life. Not, not at all. I want people to feel as little pain as they need to feel, but we do need to feel pain from time to time. We do need to be sad and angry and frightened and helping young people to understand, accept, um, and recognize the importance and healthiness of those emotions um, is a much greater gift than to take away their pain unthinkingly. Um, so um, I'm always coaching myself and trying to support parents um, not to feel that they have to make their kids feel better um, and that um, um, it's actually in their best interest to um, to break down sometimes. And this is a pattern we see, some of you will probably recognize this, um, somebody who's been through a difficult experience, whether they've been discrete traumas or whether it's just been a difficult life associated with being in a refugee family. And as a primary school age child, they've apparently coped very well. They've done well at school. They've been good children, compliant, doing their bit around the house, helping out parents when they're not up to it, that kind of thing. And then they reach adolescence and um, they seem to deteriorate. Their um, functioning deteriorates in some way. They're not attending school so much. They're rude to their parents. And people think, well, that's a backward step. And um, we need to be really worried about that. Now, sometimes that's not a backward step. Sometimes that is a recognition, whether consciously or unconsciously, that the coping mechanisms of early childhood through compliance and being good and attracting praise and those kind of things, the things that have worked well in childhood, aren't going to stand us in good stead throughout our adult life and aren't going to make us good parents. We need to let in doubt and misgivings and emotions that aren't comfortable and that can come out in adolescence in quite an ugly way um, and and we have to be careful not to suppress that or diagnose it um, but to try to make meaning of it and to understand that this may actually be a positive developmental step for this young person that it might be rather than a kind of illness it might be a developmental breakdown a breakdown that's going to lead to the person coming out with some healing at the other end of it, just like a grief reaction. We wouldn't tell people to stop grieving because it's uncomfortable for them and other people. They, we would expect that they need to go through the grieving process in order to come out the other side healthier and um, able to cope with subsequent disappointments. So, um, in the few minutes I've got left, I just wanted to shift gear to talk about some of the more practical things that I find helpful 
when I'm working with young people where communication about their distress might not be straightforward. I mean, if you happen to strike a young person who can articulately tell you about their problems, then that's fine, but frequently we don't. And so what I find useful in that situation is to remind myself that a young person who I'm asking questionings of, even if I'm asking those questions quite gently, will often experience me as tell me, tell me, tell me. And I find that um, I can establish a better relationship and get more useful information and understanding if I do some of the telling and I sort of put something on the table to share with them. I speculate about what they might be experiencing. I give them some choices. You know, maybe you're um, struggling because you're worried about your mum's health or because you're feeling like you don't fit in at school or maybe there's some other reason. Um, I put something on the table for them to examine. And if they like it, they can take it and we can start a conversation. If they don't like it, they might tell me they don't like it and that might be the beginning of another conversation. I can say, sorry, I've got that wrong. Can you help me to straighten that out? And I'm always saying to parents, find an excuse to apologize to your children. Don't, I mean, a lot of parents feel um, that, that, saying sorry to their kids means they're failing and i think just the opposite that we, we when we recognize something that we're doing that we've done that's unhelpful and we're able to take responsibility for it and say say sorry and and mean sorry and and a, a meaningful sorry is one that gives an explanation of what you're sorry about um then then instead of having a rupture in the relationship which leads to a deterioration in the strength of the relationship we have a rupture that leads to strengthening of relationship and developmental psychologists teach us that it's per parents with young infants don't get to make their infants feel safe and loved and cared for by being perfect the way they do it is by making mistakes and then correcting those mistakes so the therapeutic importance of taking a risk, making a mistake, acknowledging it and using it as a point of um, increased growth in the relationship, I find highly effective. Um, another thing that I talk to um, my students about is the notion of hedging, um, which, you know, when you're, um, and you do this in, instinctively, when you're going into difficult territory, you say, I wonder if it's possible that maybe you might think perhaps and use all that sort of modality to soften the language that you use. Um, and um, I think there, are, what I find with, with students as they're learning is that they tend to use that indiscriminately. And what I think is much more effective is that when you thought is when you are thoughtful about the way in which you hedge, that you use hedging at times when it's appropriate to draw people out and to soften the message, but that you're really clear and direct when it's appropriate to be clear and direct. When you're saying, for example, that domestic violence of all forms is unacceptable, that's not a place for hedging. And so I, I um. I mean, that all can't, sounds pretty obvious. I, I didn't get that until it was pointed out to me by a, by a linguist colleague. And I've found that now that I'm aware of it and use that, use that awareness in my interaction with patients, um, it's extremely helpful. Um, I think with, with traumatized children, we all, always also need to have some physical modalities in mind to use. I'm very, um, I, I like the, the idea that uh, Porges talks about um, in relation to the vagus nerve and the autonomic nervous system and interventions that are designed to, to help people to settle their autonomic nervous system, whether it's breathing exercises or physical exercise or other activities. I think the capacity to move from the psychological to the physical um is attractive and particularly when that physical is about things that are health enhancing rather than medications or um other 
interventions that um, have harms as well as benefits. Um, so I think that were the main points I wanted to make and I really look forward to um, sharing more thoughts when we get to the panel discussion later on.